So the way this is going to work, right, is if you do not uh, come to the, the mic, right, we just assume, right, that we just keep using uh, pigeonhole questions for the time being. Okay. Can we so, start with the Maya? Oh, can? That would be fantastic. Sorry, sir, I didn't see you. Give me a very quick moment while I get so, the system up and running. In terms of the comes act, uh, the speaker emphasized and highlighted the word ideally, but uh, did not explain why it's not ideal in the comes act. Um, okay, the reason why I said ideally was because all these are essentially just recommendations. Okay, so in terms of the different broadcasters or networks trying to en uh, enforce the uh, ITU RBS uh, 1770 standards, now essentially it's pretty much just their recommendation. Okay, however, whether or not you know, different uh, production houses or content providers uh, conform to that standard is another thing altogether. Okay, but otherwise it's just a form of basically highly recommended. Okay, so it's just a guideline. Uh, it's not compulsory because uh, I experienced up to the last two evenings, yep. the commercial is still too loud. So they just <laughs> ignore because probably the advertiser <laughs> wanted to be loud. Yep. Yeah. Now the thing is with the Count Act, it was pretty much proposed by the ATSC which was based in America. Now, for the international broadcasters, they are following this a lot more closely. Essentially, this is still a pretty new thing locally at the very least. So, uh, everyone is still kind of like in that phase of trying to play catch up. So hopefully in time to come in the near future, we should be getting a lot more uh, healthier sounding content as opposed to what a lot of us may be experiencing now. Okay, so some content, like uh, I think like I pointed out just now, some of y'all still find that it's too loud, whereas for me, based on my personal experience or maybe for some people in the audience, they may find that it, it's actually gotten a little bit better. But of course, with all things, a lot can be done to be uh, further improve the situation. It's a work in progress. Though. I think it's not just us. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's internationally, it's still being adopted. When did it start, the changeover? When did CALM get implemented? 2012. 2012. So it's only been two years, to be very fair. Yeah. For Singapore, I think it's more like one year, maybe? Uh, start of 2014 last year, actually. Yeah. So while the rest of the networks like Discovery and NetJo, they were already adopting it since uh, I think early 2013, but Singapore, uh, soon as we actually got uh, to s follow all these, uh, the new lockdown standards was actually 2014, early 2014. Yeah. The main rationale for the CALM Act, it's, it's not enforceable by law in any way other than the states because it's basically an FCC initiation. I think the reason why a lot of people are getting on board with it is that because it's a problem that a lot of people see as a problem in general on television. So even though it's not uh, required by law, they're just seeing it as a way to improve production standards for television. Because they don't want the consumer to have to keep adjusting the volume every time it goes to a commercial or when even maintaining consistency across different channels. Correct me if I'm wrong, right? So I'm gonna ask Kevin this question, okay? Is, is, was, was it the case that the old standard was abused? Okay, I'm gonna explain. Mm. So last time we were told minus 20, to minus 12 or minus 10, whatever. Was it abused in the sense that some, some, uh, some commercial makers said, eh, forget about the minus 20, like, we just make it minus 16 to minus 12. And we'll, so it'll be louder than everybody else's, so we are more outstanding. Is that what happened? Uh, I think like what I highlighted in my, one of my slides is where like, in terms of the loudness peaks, okay, you can only, you shouldn't go beyond, you cannot go beyond minus 10, but it's because of the loudness uh, because there are two measurements in terms of how we read the audio levels, peak levels as well as uh, average lo uh, loudness levels. So while you can pretty much force your peak to not go beyond minus 10, okay, but pretty much a lot of people were kind of like just cranking the threshold on their compressors or their limiters mm. to the point where you know, it gets louder and louder, but digitally in terms of the peak, it still registers registers at minus 10. So in other words, I, I guess what we're saying is that the measure, measurement tool was bad. Like, was, a, was the wrong way of no, measuring it perhaps? Wrong uh, wrong method. I wouldn't say wrong, but it had its flaws. It has flaws, yeah. okay. Because one of the things that uh, I heard, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding of what the new standard means, right, is that for, you know, last time when we, for those of you who work in media, especially for feature films, um, you would know that there is, there is um, there's theatrical mix for cinema, and then there's broadcast mix. So for those of you who have finished feature films, right, you know that after you finish your feature film, you actually need to create a new mix for TV. You cannot use your theatrical mix for TV because it's too loud or too soft, or both at the same time. Basically, the dynamic range, range is, is too, too large. large. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, but what I understand is that with the new standard, right, the mix should work for both platforms. Does that is that true or is it actually not true? Uh, okay, maybe I'm not the best person to answer. I suspect that the the new mix may work, but I think it's also an issue of the the context because when you go to the cinema, everyone's like, oh, handphones off. Everyone's kind of keeping quiet. So the dynamic range in a cinema is wider also because there's less distraction. Everyone that's there has paid money to sit down to watch the, the, the movie. So you're not going to get a lot of distraction. And what happens is that in the cinema, the dynamic range can actually be a lot wider. You can actually have the silences be real silences. You can have like tinkling of piano keys having being very low in the mix because everyone's keeping quiet, they can hear it. Whereas in the house when you're watching at home on television, you could be ironing, baby could be crying in the background. So I think that's also part of the reason a lot of people abuse the old system and tried to force the dynamic range very narrow so that it was, it was punchy, so that it could break through the distraction of being in a TV where you're not necessarily as focused on the content as you would otherwise be in the cinema. Pretty much it's just forcing your mix to basically cut through any kind of potential noise factors in terms of whether it's coming from the immediate environment, your parents cooking or whatever not and a lot of times you know where do we view a lot of our tv contents not just at home but even places as noisy as like for example a coffee shop or hawker center or food court so there's all these uh, extraneous uh, noise factors which is why a lot of times they tend to really try to crank up every single uh, element within the mix from the dialogue to the sound effects especially like your softest whisper is as loud as your your harshest scream so in, and that's the the nature of uh, traditional broadcast mixers, whereas with the new standards, I think what they're trying to do is to encourage a slightly healthier dynamic range, while a theatrical mix will still need to be conformed in some way to, the, to a broadcast mix, but in terms of this, the differences or the discrepancies, it should not be as wide as it was before, mm -hmm. as compared to you have a huge dynamic range uh, for your theatrical versus your broadcast mix, suddenly it just shrinks down and everything is just squashed all the way through to the point where there's practically no dynamics. So this is kind of like the median point in between. So the theatrical mix and TV mixes, even with the new standards, still need, need to exist. La. There still need two mixes. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Okay, I'm just going to very quickly answer this. Uh, it's not really a question per se. Uh, let's see if it's gone active. No, it's not. Let's see. Now it is. Okay, um, I'll just very quickly uh, get this question out of the way. It's the first one on the list, okay, but it's not really a question about the topic, so I'll just quickly put it through. So, uh, we said to you that this is the last in the series. Can organizers publish the notes and put online? We have never put the notes online, uh, but what's going to happen is this. If you notice, there are actually four cameras uh, around the room, and they've been recording the session throughout, and that's why you know, Kevin and we tried, uh, actually put in all the effort to actually go and record his screen. The whole point right, is to cut together a video that will eventually be submitted to WDA, hopefully with the right loudness standards. We try, we try, okay? Hey, I don't even know what the internet standard is, must not see one day, okay? okay? And hopefully one day, if uh, WDA is willing, and uh, we'll discuss this with them further, it will be actually put on, on, on the internet for free. So you can watch the video, see the slides, see the video, see the demos. We've been recording since the digital media, uh, the one that's called the disruptive convergence of, of video and internet. We've been recording since then. We've not re released any of them yet. Okay, but we hope to, so that it will learn, go on to be a learning archive for everybody. Lah. Okay, so just to let you all know that we are trying. Uh, it's still a work in progress, we haven't finished them yet. Okay, so that's answered. Okay. okay, moving on. What is the recommended uncompressed tapeless format for archival purposes? Okay, now I'm going to throw this over to Dustin. What's the recommended uncompressed tapeless format? Format for archival purposes. Now, the, the question is a bit of oxymoron in some way, so I'm just going to ask Dustin to have a think about it. Okay. I think what you're referring to is a basically uncompressed file format for archival. I think the issue with archival is that um, when you archive, you're generally trying to save space. So what happens is that we tend to use lossy codecs to do so. Now, there are two different kinds of ways to compress files. There's lossless and there's lossy. The thing about lossless is that you don't really save as much space because you're just using mathematical algorithms to make the file smaller, but you're not throwing away detail. The definition of lossless is after I've compressed it and then I've brought it back to its original spec, it's exactly the same. So there's not as much that you can save. So uh, for archival, we tend to use lossy codecs. 
Uh, one of the issues we had, or well, one of the issues I mentioned about tapeless was that you had to keep the old tape decks. I think it's kind of the same for codecs. You've got to choose a codec that you know is not going to go obsolete in a few years. Because if you use, like, let's say, maybe a Matrox codec from like the early 90s, that codec may not be supported anymore by the, my modern software that you need to read it. So a lot of people have, uh, have varied on this. Some people like, I don't want to use a proprietary codec that's owned by Sony or Panasonic or Apple or whatever, because for whatever reason, they may pull support for it. They, and some people prefer to go with open standards like you know, uh, JPEG or JPEG 2000. I think it's a balance that you have to work out. Because if you go with uh, formats like JPEG 2000 or uh, PJPEG, for example, they're open standards, but you can't edit directly off them. You still need to convert them back to a broadcast codec. So one of the issues with that is that you, are, you basically have converted it once from your broadcast codec into the archival codec, and then you're doing another conversion back out. So you're doing, basically, it's like a generational loss because you're converting twice. But the other thing is, the reason people don't like to uh, go to, it, like, let's say, archive it to ProRes is that, okay, what if Apple decides, okay, we're not going to do broadcast anymore, and then ProRes doesn't exist. Then you've got to go and find old software that supports ProRes if, let's say, seven years down the road, you need to bring something out. I think a balanced approach between these two would be to save it in professional broadcast codecs that are, have good compression ratios, that don't throw away too much detail that you can still use, and then review every few years, like maybe every three years or four years, saying, okay, does this codec still exist? Do I need to update it or convert it to a codec that I'm confident will survive longer term. Isn't this like 5Y800 all over again? You know, we had this 5Y800, yeah, it's the best! Then like, we're gonna kill it, huh? Don't, what happened to all those 5Y800 drives I got then? Oh, too bad. You know, it's, that's the kind of feeling that people have about codecs. So, David Fincher had a very interesting analogy about, um, code, about uh, uh, for, for archiving his feature films. What he does is this, he said, we take all of the media and all, of the, all of the, the media that we have, right? And we don't just store the media, we store a drive that can read the media in the package as well. It's like a time capsule, you know? Basically, the, the archiving is like a time capsule. Not only do we put the thing inside that contains the media, we put the thing that can read the media inside and hope in the future, right, it will still work. Okay? So that is the fear, lah, okay? Just in case you're wondering, because the question asks, what about uh, uncompressed, you know? It, um, uncompressed is not feasible. Uh, so, so what Dustin answer is correct, it's lossless. You cannot do uncompressed because uncompressed uh, is in itself a state. So uncompressed is 125 megabytes per second for uncompressed 10 bit 422 HD. Not megabits, uh, 125 megabytes per second. Okay, which translates on 8 times 8 is like 1000 megabits. Right? In comparison, your XD Camp HD 422, 50 megabits, 50 versus 1000. Okay, there's no way to store the uncompressed. You'd okay? basically be in the stage where your lossless actually takes up more data than your production codec. Yeah. Okay, so it's not tenable. Like. Even if you go drop it to 8 bit, it would be like 9, 80, 90 megabytes a second. Not, not tenable. Okay, so this idea that you have to archive, right, um, for broadcast, you have to use a, 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 a relatively lossless codec. What I see more and more, correct me if I'm wrong, I see more and more people actually storing the MXFs. So whatever you use to broadcast, right, is the thing that you store. Because it is of actually a pretty amazing quality. It's actually a 422 codec. It's, it's got a lot of color in there. Uh, a lot of people are using XDCAM MXF primarily because the space saving for MX, uh, for XD, it's a 10, it's a 10, uh, group, uh, 10 frame group picture codec. So you do save quite a bit of space on that. It's 15 megabits per second for HD. So there are a lot of people using it. I think the main issue with that probably is just the, the group of picture compression and how certain things don't resolve quite as well. Smoke, detail, crowds, grass. There, there, there are some environments that are a bit challenging for the codec. Yeah. So I think if, it, if you used it for broadcast, then obviously you're okay with it because it went to air like that. So you, you, can, you can archive that. Yeah. In case you're wondering, like we said 10 bit, 12, uh, 10, uh, 8 bit, what's all this stuff? It's basically the amount of color. So if you use XD Cam, it does 8 bit color. Okay, then if you use AVC Intro, it does 10 bit color. Now you're thinking, what's, what's the difference? Okay, um, AVC Intro, uh, the, the 10 bit color means you have about 1 billion colors to access. Okay, whereas 8 bit, you get 16.7 million colors to access. So there's quite a huge difference in number of colors. Can you see it? Honestly, probably not. I explained to you why. Your TVs at home, all those LCDs that you bought, are all 8 bit. So all the remaining of the billion, you can't see them. Okay, most of the time. Most of the time. 
Okay, unless you own a broadcast monitor, in which case you're not really a consumer anymore. You're at some other level already, you know, <laughs> of viewership. Okay? But just to let you know that that's why, and that's why the ABC Intra codec is twice as heavy as the XD cam. It's 50 yep. versus 100. Yep. It's, it's quite a bit more. Yeah. The main difference between 8-bit and 10-bit really isn't for your eyes to see. The, the latitude that you get from 10-bit is more for computers to you know, push them for grading or for, for getting a cl cleaner colour key. It's not really for your eyes to see. Okay. We're just going to jump to the next one. Okay, the next question is, what is the def best default video format for broadcast? Is it MXF or MOV? Um, I will, I will uh, I'll get uh, Dustin to answer this one as well. Um, I would say that everyone is moving towards MXF firstly because it's a standard that is cross-platform. Uh, I mean, MOV works on Windows as well, but uh, even in my facility where we switched to using uh, from FCP7 on Macs, we switched to using Premiere on Windows. Uh, delivering MOVs is actually quite challenging in a Windows environment because there are certain codecs that can't go into an MOV container on Windows and that's because MOV is developed by Apple. So there isn't really an incentive for them to get it to work properly on a Windows machine. So where we used to deliver IMAX 30 on MOV uh, for SD, what happens with uh, Premiere is that we can't do it anymore. We can deliver IMAX 30 inside MXF but we can't do it in an MOV and that's what our servers and that's what our automation servers require us to deliver in order to have the automatic, um, automated workflow to take place. Yeah. So I'd say MOV in a cross-platform environment doesn't work out quite as well. MOV works if you're confident that your entire pipeline is all uh, basically Mac-based and there's no need for any Windows or Linux machine to be outputting. In case you're wondering, remember just now I had a slide where it says uh, there's some standalone products like Harmonix, Pro Media, Carbon. That is that is something you would use in a Windows environment to encode MOVs. And that's why you pay so much for it. It's, you really can do things that most of the NLEs don't. But you, have, you probably need a very specific reason to do it. Lah. I mean, if you don't have a specific reason to make MOVs, if you can work MXFs, if your servers can work MXFs, I think that's generally what uh, is being pushed towards. Lah. On the broadcast delivery side, a lot of it is actually determined by what your server will accept. So there are certain, um, like, for example, our broadcast server accepts MXFs, OP1As for XD cam. Um, then if we use EVS for slow motion in live studio environments, it has to be uh, MXF A, uh, AVC uh, 100. So it, a lot of it is determined by hardware that requires a certain uh, delivery mm. spec. Again, uh, so to answer this question once and for all, it's, uh, it's not about quality. Uh. There's not, there's, it doesn't, it's not a case where MOV is better quality, MXF is lousy quality. The XD Cam HD422 codec that sits in an MOV is the same one that sits in the MXF. It's just a different container. And what determines the container? The server. What can the server read? Can it read MXFs? Can it read MOVs? Can it read both? And then what can you churn out? Can your editing machine churn out MOVs? Can it churn out MXF? The quality has no difference. It's the container. Okay, so just to separate those two issues. Okay, so I just mark this answered. Okay. Um, this is a very interesting question that will go to Kevin. Okay. Okay, it says here, I know this is a broadcast seminar, but are there recommendations for YouTube and online videos? It has really come to our, okay, come to haunt us. Okay, for both visual peaking and audio loudness level. Audio, visual peaking I'll talk about later. Uh, audio loudness level we'll address first. Okay, the thing is with YouTube or online platforms, there is still no fixed unified standard throughout because pretty much if you look at a, at a platform like YouTube, pretty much anyone can churn out content for YouTube and basically just you know, standards be them, okay? But otherwise, in terms of the pro professional production houses, uh, what they are usually requesting for will be somewhere at about uh, minus 6 dB uh, peak level. So far, no one's really uh, nitpicking on how loud it should be, but in terms of peak, uh, output peak instead of minus 10 for broadcast, they're saying, oh, online, everything uh, minus 6. So far, in terms of my experience, uh, and it's been pretty okay so far. What's the average? Sorry, so minus 6 is the peak, what's the average? Or what LU, what LUFS would uh, you use okay, for online? Okay, from, from what I understand, if, um, if I was to look for an online reference, podcasts was actually like, their measurement was based on LUFS of minus 18. Okay, so minus 18 and then peaks at minus 6. Yeah. Okay. That, well, if you want something a bit safe uh, rather than you know, everything AYL. But so far, like I said, because there is no one governing the internet, unless of course Big Brother is watching. But otherwise, no. Minus 6 peak and minus 18 LUFS or LKFS would be about okay. a pretty good gauge. Okay. In terms of visual, um, I'm going to throw this to Dustin in a short while, but 
Um, same thing as Cowboy Land. Uh. Okay, so YouTube, any form of online streaming is Cowboy Land. Okay, I just had an interesting experience where I spoke to, um, I, if I'm not wrong, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. If you work for Apple, which I hope you don't because we just talked about Apple. Okay, but if you work for Apple, please feel free to let me know. Uh, because uh, we, we understand that even for iTunes, iTunes, when you download iTunes, doesn't actually require you to fit broadcast spec, if I'm not wrong, uh, because it's not really a, a traditional broadcaster. Um, so, and YouTube, of course, there is no such thing. So what happens is, in traditionally with YouTube, right, uh, a lot of people are actually sending levels that are 110 without ever realizing it. Does it hurt the YouTube transmission? No, nothing happens. In fact, the number one question I had when I was growing up as a filmmaker, uh, one of the number one questions, I'm really a geek, okay, is what happens when you, tra when you broadcast something that is 110 on air? What actually happens? Will it destroy the transmitter? Will the satellite blow up? Will the satellite dish crack? You know, what, what exactly happens when we send this signal out? You know? Actually, I can answer that. Yeah, that's why I'm going to get him to answer that. Why? <laughs> of course, I know you know the answer. Of course, of course I've told you this before. Yeah, okay. yeah. Right. Uh, what happened once was that uh, I was at a hotel and I was actually watching a channel. And what I noticed was that every once in a while, the channel would just skip. The entire uh, vision would just skip and have black lines coming out. I was trying to figure out why. Then I realized that it skipped whenever it cut to the wide shot of the studio, which had a white background. So basically, the, the fact that the video signal had skipped was doing something to the, to the box that was resulting in the transmission skipping sync. Yeah. Was this a CRT at the time? No, this was a uh, flat screen. Flat screen LCD. LCD. Wow, OK. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I've heard, and I've not seen it myself, so anybody who has seen it, please let us know. I've been told that if you transmit above 100 IRE, you actually introduce buzz into the sound. So it will affect the sound. But because I've never seen such a signal, uh, I have never seen Analog, right? It's analog transmission, right? So this is the other thing we've been hearing recently. Okay, I'm not sure whether we should say this because it's so damning, okay? But I've been told by some people that for digital transmission, there is no such problem. Okay, so you start trans transmit 110 IRE, theoretically, okay, there is no problem for digital transmission. As you know, MediaCorp has been telling the whole world that they're on digital, right? You, know, you saw the ads, right? You know, it's behind me and everything. So, but the truth is that a lot of the overseas broadcasters, maybe because they're trying to be analog um, uh, compatible, are still insisting on these standards. So the, the standards are not going to go away anytime soon. Will they go away? Maybe. Maybe one day when we're all just streaming Netflix and never watching like broadcast, maybe we won't care anymore. You know, maybe. I don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, uh, I think on the YouTube part, actually, there are a couple of things that you should be aware of, especially if you're editing in a broadcast environment and then you're transmitting on YouTube. Because when we edit in a broadcast environment, uh, we sometimes edit on interlaced codecs. But then if you export that way on YouTube, YouTube is progressive. But if you're editing interlaced and you export that way, what happens is that you can see the jagged edges on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Another thing to consider when you're outputting for YouTube is that um, YouTube has its own built-in conversion engine for you. So if you export to, let's say, MOV or f formats that are not uh, native to YouTube, they do the conversion for you. But you want, if you want to keep the control over the conversion process and what you do, then there's actually a sheet. I, I have to find the link for you. But there's actually um, a help, a support help thing under YouTube that will tell you exactly what specs that you export to. And it will use your native .mp4 file rather than doing its own conversion. So if you want a complete control over the conversion profile that you use, then you should follow those specifications. Yeah, it's actually quite interesting because it's, it's a, but the problem is this, it's like, a, it's even like Facebook. Have you ever seen Facebook? You realize the layout changes every few months? Do you know that when the layout changes, right, all the graphic artists have to figure out when the new pixel count is for each picture, what, what picture, what the pixel count for the banner is versus the picture. It's the same thing with YouTube. When they change the standard, right, the, the, the software manufacturers have to figure out, crap, so is it 16 now megabits? Is it 12 megabits? Is it 6 megabits? What is it now? You know, what is the ideal amount? It's a moving target. So it's a very fluid environment, but sometimes it's also a very frustrating one. Okay, so we're going to answer, say this is answered for now. Okay, this is an interesting question. Does the film industry follow the broadcast standard? Is there any difference? I know we talked about this a little bit before. Maybe can you explain to us what the dynamic range for a film is versus broadcast so that we understand how we can mix for film versus mix for broadcast very quickly? Uh, or adapt, maybe adapt from film to broadcast. Okay, uh, I'll say first, I'm still quite new to the whole feature film mixing thing, okay, honestly speaking. So, but at least based on what I understand, the dynamic range you're looking for film is a plus minus of 6 dB. Okay, 
Okay, so you've got 6 dB worth to go up and as well as down as compared to uh, previously you were looking at a plus minus 2 dB. But of course, with the new standards, you're looking at plus minus 4 dB worth of dynamic range. Okay, so it's definitely gotten uh, slightly easier okay, to conform from, say, a theatrical mix to a broadcast mix. However, the consideration is that for theatrical mixers, majority of them are output in 5.1, 7.1, or basically multi-channel. Okay, ultimately, broadcast mix, even though we have HD channels that can accommodate a multi-channel surround output, but you still need to break down everything to stereo, two channels, left and right. What is the range for theatrical mix usually? How low can it go versus how high does it go usually? Let's say, yeah, in terms of um, LUFS and DBFS, okay. kind of okay, for, okay, for LKFS and LUFS, so far I've never heard anyone using those on theatrical mixers. Is based on different uh, standards altogether, depending again on whether you're mixing for Dolby certification or THX certification. <coughs> okay, so this one, uh, I'll be honest, I'm not uh, uh, very sure. Okay, so uh, but I'll definitely try to try my best to check it out. Yeah. What we know for sure, as far as we, I mean, as far as we understand, is you know we talk about how broadcast limits to minus twelve, the old broadcast standard. That was not actually how theatrical is mixed. Theatrical goes, goes above minus twelve. It goes above minus ten, actually. Uh, somebody told me it can go out like minus 6 and minus 3 or something. The dynamic range in cinema is actually very large. Uh, minus 2 if I'm Minus wrong. 2, yes. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so it's like just before In terms speaking. of peak, uh, relative to group scale. Yeah. Okay, uh, can, let's take a question from the floor. Um, I want to know, um, you know, are these um, broadcast standards also applicable, applicable to radio? Like, what, I mean, these are for um, TV broadcasts, but what about radio? Well, with regards to the loudness, is it? Yeah, that's right. Uh, okay, based on personal experiences, okay, so far, no. Okay, so, so everything stays as... Yeah, as so far, in terms of the loudness standards that we are uh, running through today, it's mainly for uh, visual broadcast on TV. Whereas for radio broadcast, uh, I'm not too sure if it's only unique to what we have here or other places are actually following the new standards, but so far, locally, in terms of radio broadcast, everything is still set at minus 10 output, okay? They don't actually measure your loudness. Right, and also um, in terms of like mastering for um, like music, just music alone, yep. is there any um, general standard? Or, because usually, you know, everyone wants their music to be louder, but uh, I mean, yes. is there like, yeah? Uh, there's still no actual fixed standard because the loudness war, in my opinion, is still going on. However, there was this, I think recent articles with regards to iTunes trying to enforce a sort of like a normalizer where regardless of how loud you mix your album or your tracks, right, once you throw into iTunes or in fact any, almost any other media player, it will basically just conform everything to one unified loudness level. So it's, it's supposed to help eradicate the loudness wall, but if you were to listen to the track say off the CD, which, does anyone actually still buy CDs? Like to. <laughs> okay, but otherwise there is no actual uh, so-called standard to adhere to because music again is subjective. Right. Okay, what may, uh, and the thing is, you know, what sounds good to it really depends on what the band wants or what the client uh, wants. Whereas with broadcast, it's pretty much no two ways about it. Okay, these are the standards. Either you follow these uh, specs or you don't. At least with uh, TV broadcast. But like I said, radio so far. Most recent uh, radio commercial I did was maybe last year, and no one has actually requested for any specific loudness uh, measurement. Right, thank you. I, I recently had an opportunity, uh, because I was teaching a class in, in a poly, and they wanted us to rip uh, songs from a CD. And we wanted to see what the dynamic range was, and you realize that most CDs, right, uh, don't, don't, follow the, don't follow any of the broadcast standards or anything that we're talking about today. Most of them are very close to zero uh, yeah. in terms of their peak. So it's, it's really maximizing the, the, the whole much, yeah. range. Lah. Yeah, they're just trying to max it out. And like, like many of you realize, they're just trying to be as loud as possible. I'm going to make this active right now. What online file transfer service is the industry using? I'm going to ask it as two parts. One is what is our local industry using versus maybe internationally, and maybe there's a difference. Are they using Dropbox? Are they using WeTransfer? Maybe Dustin can answer that in two parts. Uh, local and overseas. I think part of it is whether you're talking about free services and paid services. So free services, a lot of people are using Dropbox, they're using WeTransfer. I think one of the things that you consider when you're picking your f these free services is that uh, 
for example, Google Drive has a content distribution network. So what that means is that they don't just hold your file in one server, they duplicate it to servers that are geolocated around the world. So given enough time, uh, you can upload your file from Singapore and then there'll be a copy in like, you know, Oceania, Asia, um, uh, China, and wh whatever other servers they have. So what will happen then is when they have um, a content distribution network, when you download it uh, in Europe, you will download it from the Europe server rather than from the Singapore server. Dropbox, from what I understand, doesn't have that. So when you're looking at file distribution um, mechanisms, you need to also find out whether what area you're, they're going to be downloading from. And then you can figure out from there what the best service is. Uh, what we used for the Olympics was uh, Aspera, which is actually a paid service. What they do is they have a, some kind of secret source where it actually transfers about four times faster than we did through FTP. So what, what they do on the back end, I mean, it's proprietary code, but I've spoken to the developer, and, and it's something like they use UDP instead of TCP. So essentially, instead of having a lot of error correction bits, they just uh, devote a lot more of their data stream to just data, and then use less error correction bits to, to make it faster. That's their secret source, basically. Very cool. Maybe you can give us an indication of um, how much uh, the paid service costs, so people understand why um, you know, the paid not more people service. do it. The paid service cost is it, it's subscription based and it's determined on uh, basically the country you're sending it from, and they will customize it. So there isn't any like off the sheet menu that you can. Do. You actually have to contact them. Uh, this basically the Signian and there's Aspera. These are the two main ones that we've been using. But primarily what we do when we use them, they're paid services, they're not very cheap. But uh, the context on which we use them is that it's a replacement for satellite. It's not live, so it's not immediate, but it's fast enough that you know, we can do a same day turnaround. So that's the context under which we pay for the service because compared to the cost of like renting satellite time, it's so much cheaper that it's okay. But it's still more than the comparative like we transfer. Or so it's slightly slower than real time. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Okay, so um, I guess the the last thing is, does Fox uh, accept programs from local vendors? Uh, a lot of our content is done in house. Okay. Um, I would say the context under which we work with uh, digital transmission is when we send teams overseas and they have to submit back stories. So they they're not submitting a full program, but they may be submitting a four minute segment. Uh, so, like the, the example again is the Olympics. When we were working on the Olympics, we had teams that would be sending, up, uh, sending back stories at maybe 4 in the morning, 6 in the morning. So we had to come up with an automated workflow that would just seamlessly have the files go into our server. So we just set up a port that would accept these files and then these files would automatically go into the server based on when they were sent and, and uh, what names they were given. I'm going to throw this question back to the floor. For those of you, I, how, how many here? Uh, from production houses that deliver to MediaCorp. Anyone? Anyone here is delivering to MediaCorp? Or Starhub? Starhub is fine. Oh. Anyone? Nobody is doing file based delivery at all? There's one name? Oh, there's one person. So I just want to throw the question back to the floor. If, for those of you who are delivering locally to either MediaCorp, Starhub, or even maybe Mio, what are you using to send it to MediaCorp, Singtel, or Mio, or, or Starhub? Are you bringing a hard disk to them? Are you sending WeTransfer? Are you. FTP, anyone knows? We've used uh, Google Drive. Google Drive. Send. In fact, uh, in one of the cases, we, uh, the client could not open the, any of the Google or any other links. So we actually sent a Vimeo link from which you can actually download. So who but is this? Was this MediaCorp? Was it uh, Starhub? No, it's not about MediaCorp. It's, it's one of the Broadcasters. clients. Yeah, for, uh, it was mainly for internet delivery, online okay. delivery. Okay. But the client had a broadcast requirement too. I see. But they use it for... Ah, okay, I understand. Okay. I was hoping for, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, say again? Our last TV show was delivering hard disk to MediaCorp in different format, HD and SD. Okay, so hard disk as well. Hard drive, yes. I see, okay. Hmm, interesting. Hard drive, yeah. mm. Okay, la. so that answers that. We shall go ahead and mark this. This one's a bit uh, controversial. Uh, I shall just quickly answer this and then move on. Okay, so why is speed grade better than co just color correcting in Premiere? Basically, it doesn't matter whether it's speed grade, DaVinci, or any other color grading program. The whole point, right, is 
Uh, even if you use Magic Bullet, you know, it, it'll still be better. Let me explain. Because all NLEs, right, uh, whether it's Avid, Apple, or Adobe, they're not really built uh, for color correction over long term. It, it stems from very basic things like, for example, if I want to color correct, do you all realize that I had to apply an effect first to in Premiere? Before I can even do any color correction, I have to apply effect to the Premiere clip. Then I go to the color, uh, effects control, then I go and do manipulation. In Speed Grade, right, the first thing you see, color correction already. It's the whole thing, when you jump the shot, is built for color correction. So you don't, you don't waste all these minor little steps of adding um, uh, the effect first before you start to color grade. The other thing is flexibility. So things like the curves, um, uh, things like um, better uh, secondaries where we can select specific parts, uh, things where even control of the low, mids, and highs is a lot more fine in a color grading program. So for example, if you didn't notice, right, in speed grade, there is um, sub, sub um, windows for the color grading. So not only do you have the offset, gamma, and uh, gain, which is your low, mids, highs, you have individual controls for just shadows, so just the shadow region, individual three controls just for the midtones, and another three controls just for highlights to finesse them. So in terms of the amount of detail, the amount of ease, right, uh, color grading program is still always better to use, uh, a lot easier to use, and a lot more powerful than uh, just using an NLE. And this is just generically across the board. So even if you're a DaVinci user, it's still a lot easier to use DaVinci than to use, let's say, Final Cut to color correct. Um, and it's a lot faster as well. Okay, so that, that's generally just my POV. The one other thing I like about Speaker in particular is because in Speaker we no longer render out. Because DaVinci is still render out. Um, although, da, although DaVinci would probably argue that you should just edit and color grade and deliver out of DaVinci now, okay? because they are now an uh, editing program as well. But uh, because we, we actually don't render out speed grade, so it actually saves us a whole ton of time there as well. Yeah? So that, I hope that kind of answers the question for whoever asked it. I'm just going to very quickly answer this, uh, because we already did a previous forum, so we're not going to spend too much time on it, because it's retreading old ground. Now. Uh, but Basically, the, the file formats for uh, digital cinema delivery, right, are, are different. they use different codecs. And they use something that Dustin uh, mentioned just now, which is JPEG 2000, okay? And it's sent to the cinema in what we call a DCP, Digital Cinema Package. It's not just one file, it's visual and audio and subtitles and metadata and everything else. In a way, right, if you see, it's quite cute. It looks like a DVD. It looks like all the subfolders of a DVD. Because the subtitle can be turned on and off, just like a DVD. You have more than one language, kind of like a DVD as well. Okay? The one thing that it has in common broadcast, the files, the wrapper for digital cinema files are MXFs. So again, you see, it's a container. Container is container. The MXF is just a container. But what's inside it constantly changes depending on the need. Okay, so we're just going to go past that. Okay, uh, we're going to answer just two more questions and we'll stop uh, in, case, in case anyone's wondering how many more we're going to go for. Uh, there's this one from Gary Al called, what's the name of the Dolby plugin? This one should be quite fast. Dolby Media Meter 2. Okay, so we're just going to sign it off as... I'm just amazed that you got 12 votes straight away. That's, how's that possible? It came out of nowhere. Like. Okay, Carl Sole asked a very interesting question. I'm going to ask this for, from Kevin again. Do you find that drama producers only mix for broadcast, or do they also mix separately for DVD, Blu-ray, and use different standards for them? This is a very uh, thin ice that I'm treading on here. Um, okay, generally, at least based on my own personal experience, they usually only request for broadcast mixers at the very start. Sometimes, sometimes it can be like a month later, six months later, maybe two years later, they suddenly come back to you, oh, we're going to release this for DVD. And then you're thinking, okay, do I have to remix all 20, 30, 50 episodes of what I just did for you? or you know, is it going to be the same? Now, generally, uh, at least for broadcast mixers, they can, you can pretty much uh, translate your broadcast mixers straight onto DVD uh, from the get-go because pretty much it's still more or less you're uploading to the same kind of intended medium, which essentially is TV. Okay, the only consideration as to how, what's the difference between the DVD version as well as the broadcast version is potentially on the broadcast side, the compressors may... Uh, reacts differently to your mix, okay? But otherwise, okay, if we were to, they were to use your final mix dump out files and basically encode them for the DVD version, right? How you actually heard them in your studio should translate pretty consistently to the DVD version, provided they're using the same set of files. So basically broadcast 
files can pre broadcast mixers can be used for the DVDs quite safely. Like, quite safely, but like I said, subjective depending on uh, a lot of different factors. Mm. But so far for the kind of projects that I worked on that went onto DVD by chance, I kind of checked them. Uh, most of them sounded okay. okay. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, so I'm just going to do a very quick offshoot of that. Um, is that is there a case where some people who, who release DVDs, both Hollywood and locally, they don't actually remix for broadcast and just release with the theatrical mix? Have you ever heard that happen Sorry, before? Come that means do they ever use the theatrical mix yeah. for the DVD? Does that ever happen? From what I know, they, they still need to actually do a different mix. Okay, so because they the do that. firstly the dynamic is also different. So they, there still needs to be a uh, different uh, set of uh, deliverables that are given for home DVD or Blu-ray. But as to whether is it a manual uh, labor, laborer's task of remixing the whole thing or do they actually put it through like a specific uh, Adobe uh, encoder that can customize your files straight away for uh, Blu-ray or DVD playback. This one I'm not too uh, sure yet. Hmm. Otherwise okay. the general idea is that yeah, slowly remix. Okay. Um Wow, this is a very interesting Q&A session. The, the questions keep jumbling around, you know, like they're, they're like dark horses that come out of nowhere and come to the forefront. I will ask Dustin this question. This will be the last question for today, okay? This is the question. Why did 16 million of film never make it as a broadcast? Standard. I think film uh, works as very well as an archival standard. The reason for that is that you project film and that's why you can have all these like, you know, 4K remasters of all, all films because the, f the resolution in film is not restricted to a pixel. Since you can always re telecine it, you can always get the quality back. It's a great archival format. But for broadcast, I don't think it's consistent enough. I was recently watching um, the Hollywood Reporters uh, cinema Cinematographers Roundtable. And they actually asked a lot of cinematographers, like, you know, what do you feel about film versus cameras and everything? And they, a lot of them were like, no, I will still shoot on film. I love film. But then they went to projection. It was very interesting to see even the hardcore like I will shoot on film cinematographers, they're like, you know, I have to go with digital, even though I, I love uh, film, but digital is so much more consistent in terms of what it can deliver on, uh, on the, when you go to a theater and you know that you don't have to worry about dirt, you don't have to worry about all these things. So I think in terms of consistency of presentation, especially when you're presenting to so many different um, environments and the idea of physically transporting film all over the place. I think that, that it's consistency of what you're delivering. And that's what broadcast deliverables are all about. It's about consistency so that it looks the same in the Philippines as it does in India, as it does in Vietnam or wherever you're delivering. So I think film was always very variable in that sense. It, it, it can look different in the same cineplex from one theater to the other when you're delivering on film. Okay. With that, we have uh, come to the end of the Q&A. Thank you so much for attending this last of the Media Productivity Series Forum by Realizations. Thank you for your time, and we love having you. Okay, good night.